Hi Camp Followers, thanks for joining us this evening. We have got another fantastic person on to speak to us tonight. And I was just saying, this is Gemma, I'll introduce her now, this is Gemma Hodson. Um, I was just saying to her, I would love to introduce you. However, there's so much to say about you that I feel like I would forget something and then I feel really bad. So I'm gonna pass straight over to Gemma to introduce herself and then um, you'll know all her great things that she knows and you'll then understand when I tell you what we're going to talk about why she is the person to come on and talk to us about these things. So Gemma would you like to just tell us a little bit about what you've just been telling me about where you started, how you know what you grew up with your dogs exactly what you just said to me basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so if I start with kind of what I've done and who I am now. Yes, um, so I am, well, my name's Gemma, obviously. Um, the name in the corner is a bit of a giveaway. Um, <laughs> I, I am a myofunction or massage therapist and rehabilitation therapist. Um, I'm also a behavior practitioner. Um, I'm an ACE advanced tutor and I'm also a T-touch practitioner as well. And um, I've lived a life with dogs from the age of about uh, six or seven. Um, I'm 41 now. I've grown up with show dogs. Um, so dogs that are, are taken to confirmation shows, um, specifically uh, Spaniels, Cocker Spaniel, Welsh Springers, Italian Spanoni. My grandparents had German Shepherds. I now live or I'm owned by uh, an English Bulldog. <laughs> um, so I grew up with knowing or having it ingrained in me what good movement should look like um, absorbing it, it without even yeah knowing. exactly yeah. and seeing the dogs being um kind of moved and assessed and I was dragged to so many shows as a kid um <laughs> I, I I I didn't have much of a life as a you need to cry for me if you want to um, <laughs> but, it but it's probably quite a nice life some people would be quite envious yeah. probably yeah yeah and I, there wasn't a dog show I probably didn't go to um yeah. between the ages of about six and maybe 15 um, oh, and even even having to take my parents to um some dog shows kind of in in the later years as well um yeah, yeah you, you grow up knowing what um what good movement um should look like um yes. i've also got a background in horses as well i studied at Hartford college for three years um and and yeah my i kind of combine what i do now um i've got an obsession for for canine movement um and behavior and i've, I've mashed them together and i all I see now are cases of uh, dogs with pain related behavior and discomfort within their body. Which says something, doesn't it? Because if you initially start off as a behaviorist and all the other things that you're doing, and yeah. then you're finding that there's that many that are coming to you with pain related behaviors that you can just do exclusively that, that's yeah. telling you quite a lot, isn't it? That there is a lot of this behavior out there, a lot of painful it's, dogs. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I've worked with dogs that have had issues from puppyhood um so it's not just a case of there being a behavior change and you know something's developed um i've worked I've, one particular dog, which i will show you um some coach changes on a little bit later um she had issues right from when she was a puppy and it was put down to behavior and when i go into it you'll find out actually it wasn't the case that wasn't the case yeah. at all and she's now got a habitual behavior left from having to live a life of pain unfortunately really yeah yeah so, so even though the pain is now under control or being managed there's it's something being managed, that yeah. Yeah. yeah some yeah. things that you, you know you just can't do but you know we can actually see how her condition is developing because of spikes in her behavior as well which right is really cool on one aspect because we know what's going on for her um yeah. and she can be supported and managed and i'm still very much part of her support team um with her owners and things like that as well so yeah yeah. But I, I also do a lot of consults um, for other trainers and behaviorists that can kind of see maybe there's not something quite right with a dog. And then they call mm -hmm. me, and say, can you just give me another set of eyes on this? Um, and more recently, I've actually started to, to teach people to do what I do. So go through the process that I go through and use yeah. game analysis and posture analysis and all those things to actually, because they spend so much time with, with dogs, more so than yeah. vets yeah um, I think they're better um placed actually if, if they actually look at a dog as a whole and know a bit more about how they work um yes. they can actually go okay well let's let's take things further Let, let's actually get in a, a vet involved in this and I can tell the vet what I see and now yeah. I think for the vet as well so we can actually help you um yeah. you know to to, to to support that dog better 
Yeah, because we yeah. always say about this, you know, um, uh, well, we're just talking mainly about arthritic dogs, but with, with any case, you know, it, to best treat um, an issue with a dog, if you have other specialists that can come in and you can all work as a team, and it's something that we say probably every other Facebook Live that we do, um, yeah. or every live that we do, it's all about the team working together and communicating yeah. with each other and using your expertise to then help us use our expertise as a vet to to, to right. do the right, right things so 100%. it all ties in so well doesn't it if you use everything that you can yeah it's like i've also got um some other paraprofessionals that i can actually refer to and because i i see a lot of dogs with behavioral problems specifically reactivity that have been mm. brought on by pain and it's not something that you can just um hand over uh, to somebody who doesn't really know about behavior so I've got people that kind of work with me for a long time and that can they actually say right okay you can come with the dog and help us to have that connection with the dog so we can then help the dog so that's yeah. pretty cool as well so I've got people yes. that I can kind of refer to that can that can help with the behavior side of things as well and kind of take things at a dog's pace as well yes. which is really really important yeah yeah which is one thing that we are going to talk about this evening because you i um, mean you mentioned just in your introduction there about the animal centered education and yes. and and how that works with free work as well so it, if you are like me anybody watching and you think what what was that free work what um it's actually something that i've learned a little bit about just looking because we're having Gemma on and just having a chat to her before and uh, i think it's just really really useful and you will see why but we will talk about that but yes. I think what we're going to do, Gemma has amazingly done this uh, presentation for us, which just looks fantastic. Um, so what I'm going to do is start to share the screen. Um, and if you want to start making your way through what we um, kind of put it in your order. Um, yes. But if you do have questions as we go through, I may not jump to them immediately because I know what's coming and you might have your <laughs> questions answered somewhere later in this presentation. Yeah. Um, but I will keep an eye on them. We're getting loads of spam comments at the moment, which I'm just going to ignore as we, we sometimes are. do. It's a little bit annoying, but there we they go. They popped up on my page earlier, actually, as well. So. Oh, did they? So weird. Anyway, ignore that. And I will try and search through the the, the more interesting comments that are going to come in, I'm sure. That's OK. Stop me at any time, by the way. Thank you. So not a problem not a problem so hopefully you guys can see my screen um so i thought i'd actually start off by talking about what good movement looks like because i am i'm a firm believer in in actually if we if we educate people in what good movement looks like then when something changes or when someone thinks hang on my dog's a little bit off they they, they can spot that more easily yeah. um and a lot of people don't realize how a dog should actually move and um, maybe what their paces should look like um how they should be using their limbs um but i actually help what the whole body looks like as well when when we're looking at movement for a dog so I have had, um, I've, I'm a bit of a kind of um, stalker where this guy is concerned, I'm not going to lie. I absolutely love his work. The guy is called uh, Professor Dr. Martin Fisher. And um, yeah, he's done a lot of work into looking at different breeds and actually um, looking at how those breeds differ in their movement. And he actually did a study, a Yenna study um, called Dogs in Motion. And he took 32 different breeds of dog and put them in a controlled environment and actually um, compared and looked at the forces involved going through the joints and, and limbs and everything. It's really, really cool. Um, mm. So it's I kind of uh, spark an interest or ignite a kind of little fire underneath anybody who's watching tonight then by all means go and check him out because his stuff is awesome um, yeah, I'll put a link to this in the in the Facebook live as well I mean he's got a book he put his study into a book and it's called Ox in Motion comes yeah. with this cool DVD um, showing all these different breeds on the treadmill and going through their paces and things like that and um part of my little light stalking, um, I actually contacted him. He's given me permission to share some of his footage from his study with you guys tonight, which I'm super chuffed about. Yeah. Um, so every dog is different, okay? And, you know, we're looking at, um, if we break it down, um, in essence, we're looking for uh, straightness. OK, and that's not necessarily straightness of the, how the limbs move, but straightness on the path that the limbs take. So mm -hmm. kind of more this 
is what we're looking for. But we do know that the limb, ex limb itself will have um, a certain amount of rotation as they, they um, flex and extend as well. Uh, but generally, the path that they take, we want to we want to see straightness when the dog moves. So if I do a little bit of Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off kind of thing, <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll understand. Um, so, but we're looking at fluidity as well. So how the individual joints actually move and do they look like cogs in a well-oiled machine mm. when we're looking at them um but it's not just limbs okay it's how the spine moves it's how that how that barrel how that rib cage will actually move from side to side we don't want it looking excessively so um and we don't want over extension of the limbs or under extension if you like we want yeah. the pieces to look really nice and even but again, it's breed dependent. So it's always mm. best go in and actually having a little bit of a look at how your breed should actually move. OK, yeah. and we've all seen crafts. Um, so there's a lot of information out there if you start Googling and on YouTube um, about how these dogs should actually move. Um, you know, so and in, in this study and the, in the dogs in motion study, what was the sort of smallest breed that he used to look at? Do you know? Was it like a pug or something? Chihuahua. Uh, it might have been a Chihuahua actually. I, I okay. can't remember. I'll have to I'll have to kind of dip in and, and have a look. I think it might have been Chihuahua, but his ranged from small to large. I mean there was there was some kind of a uh, few um obscure kind of breeds in there as well. Okay. Um, so different types of spaniels, French bulldog, um, sight hounds were in there as well. So there, you know, he, he took a really large range of, of different breeds yeah. of dogs. Um, from small to medium to large so uh, okay. it's an incredible study and the book is, is really really brilliant and it doesn't just dip into movement he goes into muscle structure and how those different muscles move um, as well as the skeletal system as well and the yeah. forces that are implied on the joints and, and through the different paces and it's just absolutely incredible yeah. um, like I said, I'm, I'm a massive fan of his work and <laughs> I think I can see his little portrait picture behind you actually. Have you got a picture oh, yeah, of him yeah, on the wall? It's a shrine. Right it's a shrine. <laughs> <laughs> He's absolutely amazing. Um, there, we there you go. Um, but we're also looking for balance as well. We're also looking for the dog to be able to, to move effortlessly through their paces. Um, and like I said, it, it's it's the whole body, not just the limbs that we're looking at. So if I just kind of press play on this, and this is, I'll, I'll concentrate on walk and trot for, to, for today. Um, so if we look at this absolutely beautiful spaniel, I would say that this is a really good example of a dog doing a damn near perfect walk, okay? And if we look at the sequence of footfalls, generally, yeah. It will be something like right hind followed by left, followed by right four, then yes. left hind followed by left four. Okay, so they move one limb independently of another when there's yes. one at a time, basically, um, with with about two or three limbs being in contact with the ground at any one time. Mm -hmm. But if we actually look at the way this dog is moving, you can actually see there's a little bit of to and fro movement. To yes. him, there was, there was a little bit of a tail wag, nice, easy, low um, tail wag. It wasn't straight. It wasn't kind of off to one side or, or really, really tense. But we're looking at everything as well. We're looking at the way yeah. that the head swings from side to side. As you know, if we look for lameness, you can spot a lot when a dog is actually lame by what their head does. Yes. Um, and yeah. I call it the ouch effect. So when the, when the sore limb hits the floor, they go ouch. Yeah. Yes, um, yeah. So we'll, you know, and if the dog isn't doing that and it's looking nice, free and easy and effortless, then that was a pretty good, pretty good example of a walk. Yeah, I, I would say. So if we it's go so on good to see it slow motion as well, because you I appreciate know. so much more, don't you? You, you do, and you can see every single detail within that dog. Yeah. The way that the coat's flowing as well can give you a lot of information. So even if you have one of these hairy dogs, mm -hmm. you can still you can still actually get a lot of information, regardless of how much how heavy that coat is, because that will move and undulate as a dog moves as well. So it, it's it's all relevant. It's all useful information and, and yeah. data that, that we can give to you as a vet to help us out. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we'll talk so, about the videos because I was saying earlier about videos and how um, you know we we were we rely really on videos, especially during lockdown. We've been yeah. heavily relying on owners to take videos, um, and some of them have been fantastic videos, and others 
are useful but not as yeah. useful yeah. as some yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. so we're well, going to talk a little bit about that yeah. um, coming I'm, I'm up gonna but... give, i'm going to give an example of a of a, a really lovely um yes. gate analysis video um yes. that, that you guys can kind of take away and and, and use to help um help you on, basically so if we look at a trot so this is a different spaniel so obviously he's got a dot tail but the same applies we're looking for straightness okay and with a trot limbs move in diagonal pairs okay so the right hind will move in unison with the left four there's a period of suspension where the dog's four feet are all off the ground before mm. the left hind and then the right four did i get that right yeah. <laughs> and, then no, yeah. and then hit the ground okay and again we're looking for a nice even stride length we're looking for uh, what you'll find is a tail will actually stiffen up a little bit as the dog is actually moving should i play those videos again because yes please um so they're in a trot the, the tail will actually stiffen up a little bit because it helps the dog to balance um right. the spine will become a little bit more rigid again because of stability um and the head might lower just to touch when, yeah. the, when the dog's trotting but again e nice even stride length um we call so people that know horses will know what tracking up means so yeah. ideally you want the hind foot say the, the the right hind to fall into the footprint or as close to as the the front right okay yes. and that's what we would call tracking up within horses okay but yeah. we, we really you know we don't want to see that hind foot actually coming past any of the front limbs at all because that's when we start to go into faulty action or faulty movement but in essence you know, this these two in walk and trot are just beautiful to me. <laughs> and I see that really well with the trot, actually, about that the back foot lands, you know, where yeah. the front foot has been. It really does, doesn't it? You yeah. can really definitely. see it in this video. Definitely, definitely. And again, you can see how fluid that skin is yeah. in movement. Yeah. Because we know that when, uh, or you'll see a little bit later, is that when dogs have conditions like arthritis, they will get tension in their body. And it doesn't just affect the muscles, it affects the surrounding soft tissues, and it will affect the, stick, the skin. And you yeah. had that brilliant um, lady, I forget her name, I'm really sorry, who talked about fascia and how fascia yes. was in absolutely everything. Michelle Wardhurst, yeah. Oh my days. God, I love, yeah. I watched that probably about four or five times, bless her. <laughs> and, you know, fascia will restrict, and it will restrict, uh, restrict the surrounding tissues and it will you get kind of the, the skin sticking and you can yeah. see that when a dog moves as well depending on the breed I mean I've got mm. an English bulldog he has got a lot of loose skin um but I also do a lot of body work with him but he still has areas of tension and areas where the skin might kind of get a little bit stuck um or yeah. feel stuck um or not as fluid as elsewhere on the body so yeah so yeah absolutely you know a walk and trot those two were beautiful to me and yeah, for me, that's how a dog should move. It should look effortless, nice, yes. even stride length, and 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 yeah, they shouldn't be deviating off that line of straightness because yeah. that's when we start to see the problems, um, and that's when it can leave joints open to excessive wear and tear and play, yeah. which leaves the joint predisposed to osteoarthritis. Oh, right. Just to, you know that just this is so important because I'm sure anyone watching this is now tomorrow going to be out just watching their dog really so. really intensely um and actually there's a lot of things that like you say if you don't know what's normal you don't appreciate because if your dog was always moved in a different way you just think it is normal for that dog and and it it might be because this is obviously a spaniel but it's knowing what's normal so that you can appreciate those changes that aren't aren't right really it's exactly. really important exactly and every breed is different which is why i say if you've got if you've got an english bulldog if you've got a german shepherd they're going to move differently to a spaniel yeah. that needs to be taken into account but make sure that you actually look at um you know confirmation shows to basically to see how how these breeds move um yes. if you've got mixed breeds look at a combination of them and kind of and, and compare them because your your dog will kind of like drift kind of like to one one breed or another but you yeah. can you can then start to go well, actually hang on he's showing a little bit of this in this pace or he's showing a little bit of this breed in 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 this pace so um it's worth knowing that your breed and knowing how they move yeah yeah it's really useful information that so yeah if you want to go back and watch those videos i'll make sure that you have can hopefully yeah. do that with the link 
Absolutely, absolutely. So moving on, I thought I would show you um, a gate uh, analysis assessment that one of my students did as part of uh, one of the courses that I run. Um, I'm going to name her. She's Jackie Shave and she's absolutely brilliant. Um, she's a fantastic student. Um, and it's just, yeah, the, the, the videos that she's put together are fantastic. So with a gait analysis assessment, if you're thinking or if you're kind of concerned about your dog and your vet actually asks you to send in some video, okay, we want to see the dog from different angles. Okay, so that's from the front, from behind and from both sides. Okay, and a little bit of movement from above as well, you know, because that can give us a lot of information. Mm. Ideally, we want to see the dog moving freely if safe to do so i can't stress that enough um yeah. and equipment free if possible as well because we know that equipment can actually affect the way that a dog moves due to the structures that it lies on top of mm. um, obviously i mean even a correctly fitting harness can affect the way that a dog moves um yeah. and can hide things as well um, so it's best that when you do do a gait an analysis like this, that you actually kind of remove all, all equipment, ideally, if you can get your dog to do it. Yeah. If you can't, a lead attached to a collar will be absolutely fine. Um, and you'll see with this with this dog, absolutely so completely different from the Spaniel, but nice, lovely, even stride length. She is just ever so slightly triple tracking. I don't know if you guys can see that. And with that... What's triple of, tracking? Triple tracking. So normally a dog will move on two planes of motion. OK, so when they're yeah. walking, they do that. When they trot, they actually bring their limbs closer together. And that's to help with balance and speed. Some yep. dogs do single track, which is that. OK, right. But generally, they bring their, their, their paws closer together. Okay? OK, so when they're triple tracking. OK, so I, ideally, the, the hind limbs follow the front limbs on pretty much railway tracks, if I said yes. to you like that. But with triple tracking, what happens is, is that either one or both of the hind limbs will actually just move ever so slightly to the side. And okay. the hind paw will land inside next to the front paw. Or right. just outside next to the front paw, depending on which way they've shifted. Okay. And sometimes in its, in its extreme form, the dog's hind end will actually come round quite a lot. And that's known as crabbing because it looks like the dog's moving sideways. Yes. Yeah. Which you do see quite, you, that is one of the common present, not common, but it is a presenting sign, isn't it? But not all the time, but in certain situations, yeah. the dog sort of moves like a crab instead of normally. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and that's that. basically so the dog can actually avoid its hind feet striking the front feet. Yes. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if it was a horse, we'd just call that overreaching. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, and it's all really relevant information. I, and in actual fact, I see a lot of crabbing in working spaniels. Um, right. I don't know why. I just do. I, it just seems to be a common kind of thing for them. Um, yeah. So whether it's long backs and, and short legs and things like that. Um, mm. But but yeah, to look at this, to look at this video again, you can actually see that the, the front limbs have actually moved together. She's moving a touch wide behind. Yeah. Um, and you'll see that as she just comes to a halt. So her, her hind limbs and her feet, you can actually see um, as she comes to a halt are actually outside of her, her her front limbs right okay and moving yeah. away i'll play it again in a second but as she walks away again lovely even stride length she's a little bit tense with the lower back but that could be because she's being influenced by the handler and she's being just told to slow down yes but even something like this that you do at home can actually give you the vet a lot yeah. of information a lot, of information. a lot of information to start with and also a lot of information once you start any kind of therapies, whether it be medicines or physios or hydros or whatever, to then assess how you're getting on as well. Exactly. Really so it gives you that yeah, exactly. It gives you that baseline, that starting point to work from. Um, and you know you can do a gait assessment with somebody being next to the dog but we yeah. know that, that actually can influence the dog's 
um, both the dog's behavior and both the dog's movement as well. Because the amount of times I see dogs are actually, ooh, which way am I? That they actually slightly bend around their owner's right. leg as they're moving. Okay. Which is why it's really important with it if you're into training that you train on both sides so your dog doesn't become yes. one-sided. Because then if you if you've lived a life kind of bending in one direction and then you're asked to go and bend on the other side, it can actually be quite uncomfortable yeah. for the dog. Um, but you also get when you which is why I always say try and do a gait analysis when the dog's free and free from equipment is that you can get it where the, um, where the dog's actually lifting his head and craning his neck to look at yeah. the owner. And what that does is drop everything through the hindquarters, which will affect the gait because the dog's yes. not moving it to the best of its ability and free. Yeah. Yeah. So, that makes sense. You can, you can get this kind of information out on a walk as well. So if you take your dog for a walk um, wherever and they're let off lead, get down to their level and, and start taking some some video for them actually on a walk because even that will give the vet a lot of information yeah. as well. Loads of information. We've just got a little um a couple of things here actually from there's a comment from Kate Grunzi and this I think this is quite a good name for it. Um she said triple tracking. I've never heard that, that but my dad used to call this trolley trot like a wonky supermarket trolley. Yeah that's hilarious. That's great. Wheel that goes woo. <laughs> yeah exactly and amy's written with triple tracking do the hind limbs always go laterally to the forelimbs or can they go medially and i think it could be either is that what you're saying depending on which way the dog is is drifting yeah basically. depending on what's going on for the dog every dog is different so yeah and then this um jen's also written and i think i think maybe this is the case but does this does the dog look like it's short stepping in the back when walking i think uh, you're talking about this one in the video jen i think yeah quite possibly look, quite yeah. possibly but I, like i said i think the i think the dog's actually being influenced by the handler yeah just asking the, the dog to slow down so she's not moving to the best yeah. of her ability yes. um but but yeah absolutely good spot good yeah. observation well done, like <laughs> <laughs> top marks top marks <laughs> I mean, you can see here the dog's looked to her left and she's actually thrown her left elbow out there i don't know if you caught that um so, you know, a handler can affect that even if they're not attached by a collar, yeah. and a you know, yeah. it's really, really interesting. So, yeah, she's short stepping. Amazing. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Perfect example there of Perfect. why we do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. A beautiful dog, nonetheless. And Jackie yeah. did an absolutely sterling job getting that, getting that video footage. And it goes to show how easy it can be as well. Yes. So. Yeah. Perfect. Exactly. So, so now right. anyone, any of my clients that might be watching this, this is the kind of video I'm expecting now. So you can't <laughs> tell me now. I set the bar for you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, clients. <laughs> <laughs> so now Brilliant. we're going to talk a little bit about the animal centered education. Yes. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Exactly. So. ACE, Animal Centered Education. So it is a whole animal or whole dog approach to working with dogs and animals. And it's headed up by the amazing lady or the amazing force that is, um, we should actually get her a knighthood or a damehood or something, I don't know. <laughs> but well, we'll just call her Dame Sarah Fisher for the, the process, the proceedings of the, the rest she's of the- She's coming on to do a live actually. I think it's the 31st of March or the 1st of April. She's coming on Brilliant. to do a live. So yeah, we'll okay. follow up from yeah. her. Just, just yeah. let her greatness, for she is awesome. <laughs> um, and it's, so it's a variety of techniques um, that we use. Um, some developed by Sarah, some are inspired by other professionals within the industry, and they are adapted to suit the individual need of that animal in front of them. So it's not a do this and this will happen. It's like, right, well, we will adapt what we do to help support the dog and to help the dog to learn as well. So um, it's a it's a whole it's a kind of a whole animal approach. OK, so ACE has a multitude of applications um, from training and behavior to other therapies like what I do. So I use it um, in my hands on therapies that I do with some dogs. Um, and there's one specific one in particular, which is a great tool for gathering data and data analysis. And that is the technique of free work. So what I have done also is is kind of given given you a bit of an example as well, which we'll get onto later. So when assessing dogs as part of my pain and behavior consultations, I use a number of observational techniques. Um, 
and, and different types of analysis, as you've seen. So kind of the gait analysis that I took you through is just one of them. And looking at habitual postures, we look at um, activities of daily living, not just how they can affect the dog, but how they are affected by certain conditions and injuries and, and diseases that, that can occur with the dog. Um, I also talk in depth with the caregiver um, on the dog's behaviour in general, because um, when we actually converse rather than just use forms, it can take us down a rabbit hole. So I actually do a 90 minute to two hour con just chatting yeah. consultation. Um, yeah. You you can, um, yeah, you can just find things out that you, you just wouldn't normally get when you get people to fill in forms and things like that, behavioural consultation forms. So I always so love do you do that with the dog wandering around and doing its thing or is that just with the owner just with the owner just okay. with the owner because i then send them a list of videos and photos i get them so i actually have like about a list of about 20 things that i want to see the dog doing right. which will help me to to gain an insight as to what's going on for that dog yeah. and hopefully yeah. it will i will be able to pinpoint um things that will help the vet to to, to help support the dog as well yes so yeah. um so yeah, it's an it's a free work is an invaluable tool for both assessing dogs' comfort levels and helping to improve them. Mm. Um, this free work for dogs can be likened to multi sensory multi sensory therapy um, for people, humans. And um, there is a technique that's been around since the nineteen seventies called snuzzling, um, and it's a it is a um, it's a made up word. It's it's taken from two different words from du in Dutch and okay. actually to sniff, to explore, and to relax, believe it or not. Okay, what's it called, Snuzzleland? Snuzzleland, yeah. S-N-O-E-Z-E-L-E-N, um, Snuzzleland. Okay. And yeah, I mean, it's it's been, it's, there's studies behind this and it's, it's effectiveness um, with um, adults with learning difficulties, kids, dementia, that sort of thing. And it can actually um, help with pain management as well, um, okay. which which is why it's so bloody good for dogs. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So what we do within free work, um, it allows the dog to move freely without being influenced by wearable equipment or the handler okay mm -hmm. so we will set the environment up and i'll talk you through that in a sec and we allow the dog into that environment safe environment so that they can move freely um and they can, they are free to move within the items and to engage as the items as they see fit so we don't go in there going what's this Oh, have you seen this? Yeah. You know, it, it's completely on the, you know, the onus is on the dog. It's the dog's choice um, to do what they want to do. Okay. okay. Um, and where are you when you're watching? Are you are you watching you this can, via a camera or are you in the room still? You can be in the room. You can be sat off to one side. You can be stood to one side. Um, you know, obviously you should supervise what your dog is yeah. doing because of the items that we have within free work, you wouldn't want them to kind of get into any difficulty at all. So it's always right. nice for you to, to, to observe, but because of the way that we're observing dogs anyway, I mean, we can film it, but we can be there watching it as well, because you know, right. sometimes it's best just to be there and observe and you can change things um, when you make those observations at in real time right. as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's a good point. So we know that the handler, being right next to the dog, as we've already seen, can yes. influence the way that a dog moves. Um, so, so yeah, we just stand back and we watch. Okay, so as the dog starts to explore the free work area, they gradually start to slow down, which will inevitably highlight potential mm. issues, stiffness, lameness, weight bearing, weight shifting, or, or dif differences in weight loading. Um, and when the dog engages with the items within free work, um, we start to see potential patterns um, and the way in which the dog needs to arrange their body and their legs in order to feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. We also look at how the dog turns their body, turns their head, uses their tongue, uses individual um, uh, limbs, um, how they flex their spine, how they, you know, uh, both upwards and downwards and from side to side as well. What happens with the tail? We're looking at individually, but at the dog as a whole, kind of like we'll work yeah. along, along the dog. OK, so we're giving control and choice back to the animal, which is essential for well-being as well. Mm -hmm. um, free work caters to this need within dogs and other animals and especially those dogs that have physical, emotion and, or maybe cognitive impairments. Yeah. 
So it's it's really, really, I can't stress how brilliant this technique is. Um, yeah. It's demand free. So Sarah often refers to this as NATO or no attachment to outcome. So okay. this basically means that the dog is just allowed to be a dog. We're not yeah. asking them to do anything specific at all. They, they don't have to engage with a specific piece of equipment if they don't want to. That is yeah. absolutely fine. They are free to explore their environment without us as humans asking anything of them. Right. So it really is free work. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're and is free. any of it, is there any, you, you know, it's all about, I guess, sniffing different things. Do they, is there food out that they can... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I will. I will. I will talk you through that yes. in just a okay. second. Yeah. My, my yeah. lovely video. So I'll, I'll say I'll, I'll talk you through some of the things yes. that we will we will use. So it's brilliant for um, specific behaviour problems as well. So specific stimulation of the primary senses to sight, taste, touch, and smell, as well as providing vestibular and proprioceptive stimulation in an environment that excludes all external stimulations. Which um, it makes the perception and the interpretation of those sensations much easier for dogs. So it's, it's a bit of a controlled environment to start off with. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it may help. Touch on what the vestibular and what, what vestibular might mean, um, or what it does not might mean. What it does mean, just for anyone that's not quite sure about that word. So vestibular gives feedback to the dog. So we we have a vestibular um, apparatus, same place as a dog. So it's in the head. It's kind of linked to the, the inner ear. And it basically helps the dog to um, ascertain uh, balance um, and, you know, where, where they're Oh, crikey. It's, it's a bit Rather like a spirit level. Now. Yeah, if I said a bit like yeah. a spirit level. Um, yes. That, that would kind of make sense. So it's actually kind of yeah. a weird piece of apparatus that kind of looks like that within within the head and it's got fluid in there and it just helps the yeah. dog to kind of ascertain position and balance and kind of whether they might be slightly off kilter and things like that. So it's a cool bit. Yeah. Cool bit really cool. And it does go wrong sometimes, doesn't it? So It does go wrong. It does go wrong. <laughs> and it, in particular with kind of young dogs, um, that's what you see a lot of um, maybe dogs that struggle with in the car as well because things are still developing and, yeah. and that can be a bit of a, a bit of a thing for them as well. Um, but, yeah, I digress. That's, that's Thank you. Of... Thank you. I just thought we'd, we'd use the word. I thought we should probably just, for anyone that's not sure, we should just yep. explain. <laughs> no problem. No problem at all. So free work can actually, um, can actually help to, alleviate maybe some anxieties or to lessen anxiety stresses depression withdrawal perhaps if you've got a dog that's kind of shut down um, but it can also help to improve social contact with other dogs and people um, I've used it successfully to introduce a um, one of the dogs I'm going to be talking um, about a little bit later who's highly reactive um, I've actually introduced her to a number of people using free work and now they are her best friends and she loves them oh, really it can be that that brilliant yeah yeah i never thought about it i mean we well like i said i looked in, into it a little bit um but i never thought about it in that way you know about social interaction and, and how it would help with that that's absolutely. really interesting yeah absolutely and all this is on on a parallel to snuzzling as well so if if people actually go and have a look at what that is there's the scientific studies there to back it up and i, yes. I I always say that um, we're all made of the same stuff, just rearranged a little bit differently. Um, yeah. And if anyone ever listens to the brilliant Andy Hale talk, he will tell you we were all nervous systems once, all just nervous systems, no brain, no arms. That's all we yeah. yeah, that's all we yeah. had to start off with. We all started with that. So, <clears throat> you know, yeah, it, it, what the studies that they find in humans are completely comparable and applicable to, to animals as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we can uh, we can adapt um, accordingly to the individual dog's um, responses to free work, um, that, which makes it actually uh, an increasingly appropriate and positive experience for the dog. So we mm. can actually support them um, depending on what we see and the observations that we make um, as we as we observe those dogs. So with regards to pain management, in humans, there is much published research into the multi-sensory therapy side of things. Um, particularly, if you want me to cite a particular paper or a particular study, Schofield in 2000 um, actually did a study into uh, snuzzling in humans and um, 
people that were suffering from various different chronic um, painful conditions, cancer was one of them, arthritis was another one of them. Um, and it has it actually been shown to reduce recorded pain levels, reduce depression and disability of functioning. So um, physical or, or psychosocial um, uh, issues, and it can yeah. actually help to assist in coping um, for those sufferers of um, those different um, conditions, basically. Okay. Um, so free work is low impact, so it doesn't put any excessive strain on potentially sore joints. Yeah. Um, and uh, all surrounding soft tissues. And much like Tai Chi, because there's science behind Tai Chi, it helps yeah. to reduce tension and reduce chronic, chronic pain in humans. Um, so especially those with osteoarthritis, if you actually have a look at more of the more in-depth studies. Um, yes. So free work actually can have a restorative effect um, and can alleviate tension patterns, which we'll have a look at in, in a bit as well with the, some of the things we see in coat. Um, yeah. Uh, that have formed through injury disease or uh, overcompensating in general for 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 sure, mm. pain or yeah yeah exactly exactly so i'm just going to let this video play because it's a it's a 20 minute video we probably won't go all the way through it but it's a really lovely example um a free work again one of my students the brilliant sue pine um has um, allowed me to use this today with her dog so this is in her with, house she's done this, this is, is it in her house. yeah this is in her yeah. house okay so um to begin with we like to keep things simple so we don't overwhelm the individual dog that we're working with so i tend to go for maybe four or five different textured surfaces okay mm -hmm. now those would be a yoga mat as you can see in sue's uh, a rubber mat carpet tiles uh tarpaulin a bath towel a bath mat excuse me those sorts of things um be really inventive with what you've got i've also used um some bubble wrap before now lots yeah. of different things lots of different things and you can find them lying around your your, your own home so you don't yes. have to go out and buy anything specific for this at all yeah okay yeah. Um, and that's just to give them different surfaces to see how that may vary their, yeah, their posture yeah and to give that nervous system vital sensory feedback as well so remember yeah. proprioception is a big part of this call uh, but big part of this work as well and you often see physiotherapists using proprioception yes. tracks as well um yes. which all help to uh, bring bring a sense of self-awareness back to that dog they then start to realize which limbs you know that they they all you know discover that they can actually use a limb in in a certain way and, and things like yeah. that especially after injury um and illness and things like that so like i said you can actually use anything that's lying around your home um obviously this was filmed at christmas christmas tree in the corner with a, a little oh is that what it is okay yeah, yeah. yeah flickering lights in the background on the telly <laughs> <laughs> so we also include in here things that your dog can sniff and lick and chew Okay, so in here you can see there's a snuffle mat. Um, you can see that there's a licky mat. There's also yes. a ball ball, which has been converted from a hard plastic bed. So, yeah. you know, there are uses for those things. <laughs> yeah, when you don't want them anymore, then that's, yeah. yeah. Exactly. You can you can kind of, you know, upcycle them, as it were. Yes, um, absolutely. So we want to put in, but we want to put things in there that uh, tap into dogs' self-calming behaviours, and that's sniffing, licking, and chewing. Chewing can actually lower cortisol, as can licking as well yes. within, within um, the body. So it's all tapping into that um, parasympathetic nervous system, or the rest and digest nervous mm -hmm. system. Yep. Okay, so we use a variety. Exactly, exactly. Um, we also have, um, I always like to have three different heights stations in here as well. So maybe, I mean, you can see there's a plant pot, there's an upturned bowl, there's a little yeah. step in there as well. And this can actually help us when we're looking at posture with a dog. So how the dog then starts to engage with those certain items. Because yeah. we know, I, I remember, um, Obviously, you've had Julia Robertson, the fantastic yeah. Julia Robertson, talk about posture just before Christmas. So I won't go too bit much into that. But she actually showed photos of how uncomfortable a dog looked when it was eating off the floor. Yes. How yes. Actually, raising things can can change things massively for a dog. So yeah. when we start to to use different heights, we can actually then start to observe what is actually um, more comfortable for the dog. 
Yeah, because it will vary from dog to dog and, and from condition to condition, won't it? Exactly, exactly. And I actually like to use um, books for that sort of thing, in yeah. actual fact, because books you can stack up, you can take for your way, so you yeah. can get that perfect kind of height and you can have a play of, around with it. Um, yeah. So I've got so this one for my dog. Um, she's only two, but it's like a, I got it off the cam um shop and it's like a stacking one and you just yeah. you put water or something heavy in the bottom of it so that it can't slip around because that's another yeah. thing that happens with food bowls commonly isn't it um mm -hmm. and it just brings it up just slightly um, and definitely because i watched the julia um live as well and i got it after that and yeah. definitely she looks so much more comfortable when she's eating now it's exactly around. before you go and buy something like that you can actually ascertain what height that needs yes. to be then you can yeah. go and buy it. Um, that's a good idea. Yeah. So you're not kind of wasting money. You go and buy something. And go. Well, actually, that's that's too high for my dog. Yeah. Or that's doing the thing that I want. So, you know, for, so from a supportive point of view, you know, put in different heights and different levels because you can yeah. actually see what works better for the dog. Massively. Yeah. So we also use a variety of different treats from soft to hard, crunchy, smooth. Um, sometimes you want quite big things because this can give us vital information as well on, on um, how the dog is actually kind of using their mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, just from for purely like a movement perspective with with this work, I'm not going to kind of go into everything. Um, if you give a dog a, like a crunchy treat, you can actually start to pay attention to whereabouts in their mouth that they're taking that. Yes. You know, can highlight dental issues as well. If yes. your dog is only eating on one side, um, yeah, that can give you a um, huge lot of information right there. And, you know, when if we're looking at this dog, I mean, um, I actually thought she was older than she than she was, than she is. Um, when How I old is she? She's two. No. She's two. I she's two less her. And she's a little rescue. Sue has done brilliantly with her. And up until this point, this dog had been, um, she kept herself to herself pretty much 80% of the time. Um, and she, apart from playing with other dogs, she'd never instigated play herself uh, with anything, with any toy. And it was whilst filming this first ever piece of free work with her, um, and you'll see in a second, she actually started to play. Oh, with one of the balls from the ball pit, um, and it was absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when we're looking her, looking at her moving rounds, we are looking at many things, many, mm -hmm. many things. So, but they will change as the free work session progresses. So mm -hmm. a dog that might be slightly anxious or slightly nervous might come in just a little bit stiff anyway. Yes, um, and I think that's why you think she's older. Could, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Does she have any joint issues or is she just um, mainly We anxious? don't know at present. From what okay. I've seen, I think there is an element of stiffness there. It hasn't been yeah. explored yet, but it's something that, that you know, can be explored with her um but yeah when when we're looking at her moving around so we're looking at what her limbs are doing we're looking at whether or not she will actually um want to walk fully over something or whether mm -hmm. she partially walks over something yeah um, and by that i mean i see a lot of dogs that maybe have sore joints so whether that's arthritis or cruciate or something going on hip yeah. especially going on when they step on something soft and spongy it actually causes them more discomfort because yeah it forces that joint to become unstable. They have to brace more in order to keep that joint stable. Um, and I, I actually see some dogs put their front feet on something spongy and leave the hind legs off. Or um, I did, um, last year I did a, a five day observation challenge and this one lady, um, she actually shared a piece of video footage and she'd done free work in her back garden and the dog wouldn't move off this plastic tray because the grass was long. And she do, she oh. been diagnosed with having cruciate issues, and it was, it was just so too hard, hard to walk. I mean, it was too soft to walk on, but yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I do hear stories of, of um, my dog won't go and run out, you know, loll up about in the middle of a field, they stick to the path. The path yes. is well trodden, the path is going to be a, a lot um, shorter grass, um, and it's and more kind predictable, of, I guess, isn't it? Because it's more, it's more worn, yeah. and yeah, yeah. It's Exactly, exactly. I think she's going to get to the point where she starts to play. Oh. 
Oh, and up until this oh, point, she's it. not played on her own. Amazing. Oh, and yeah. She, she sits down and is like, are you watching me? <laughs> that no, wasn't she's me. almost asking for somebody to engage with play now then, by the looks yeah. of things there. Yeah, she's just having a bit of a little bit of a process. You'll find that dogs will kind of stop halfway through and have a bit of a moment because all this nervous system feedback, the sniffing, the walking over different textures, it's giving that that nervous system new experiences. And yeah. and more often than not, they're a positive experience. And sometimes a dog just needs a minute just to process that and to yeah. kind of have a bit of a think about what's going on for, for their body and, you know, what things feel different. Yes. I've, I've already touched on the fact that how free work can be a lot like Tai Chi and those those small movements and a dog being able to move at liberty, oh, bless her heart, oh. um, <laughs> move at liberty can release areas of tension. And when an area yeah. of tension release, it might feel funny to a dog. We don't know what yeah. they experience because their experience is, oh, no, but, uh, their experience is unique to them, just like yes. pain unique to the individual. You know, we should never say that dog is definitely not in any pain because we don't know. We're not them. Um, no. So it's always really, really interesting um, to watch a dog go through free work. She's having a bit of a process there. She's kind of having a bit yeah. um, She's probably even thinking, well, you, like you say, you never know what they're thinking, but I feel like in her head she's going, wow, that was fun. But hang on, hang on. I've not done that before. I should probably stop that. Oh, but that's fun again, isn't it? I feel, yeah. I feel like I'm having this commentary of her of what's going yeah. on in her head. <laughs> but, but dogs are so clear. Dogs are so expressive when yes. we just take the time just to like, bless her heart. Oh, oh. Um, When we just take the time just to kind of stop and, and, and watch what they do, because as humans, we go through life at 100 miles an hour. Dogs didn't choose to come and live with us. We've kind of plucked them out and gone, okay, you're our friend. You're going to live with us. And, you know, yeah. you know we, we don't stop to, to think about the effect that kind of household stuff and our life kind of has on them. So yeah. got, this is just, it's just a lovely way as well just to connect with your dog, mm. giving mm. them that freedom. You know, and you can see her, you know, as she's going through the free work, she's actually starting to check in with her mum, the brilliant Sue, who's just kind of off one side. And she's having a That's amazing. So good. So cool. I could watch that. I watch that all night, but I won't do it. I know it's the time. So that is fascinating. And also, I think you can see that she gets less, I mean, she doesn't move any faster, but she does get a little bit less stiff as time goes on through that. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, dogs will um, will actually come at free work differently. I see dogs that just burst in, yeah. spaniels, working spaniels that just burst in and they're just like, they're like a whirlwind and they'll just yes. go around and, and kind of like they're into everything. Um, but other dogs are more methodical, like like that, so like Sue's yeah. dog was. Um, but we'd also be looking for... Um, you know, not just kind of what they're doing with their limbs, but the way, the direction in which they're going around the free work. Yeah. Can yeah. they only turn in one direction or can they turn equally in both? Or is it more habitual one side than the other? Yeah. And then coming on to, so this is tag. This is a, yeah, a dog. Somebody said this is tag. <laughs> somebody commented that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Rachel. video. That, yeah, this is a video that nobody's seen before. Because <laughs> um, uh, everyone has seen uh, tag doing free work for the very first time. Um, and this was a dog that when I first met him, touch was off the table. He had a bite history. He was highly reactive to sound, touch, um, the, the the sight of, oh, it's easy for me to say what he wasn't reactive to. And that was really? lovely. Yeah. Um, oh. Car, bikes, bin lorries, knock at the door, shadows, um, that sort of thing. He would, he would uh, chase uh, lights and shadows and things like that. Um, he would tolerate me putting a harness on him. That was about it. Um, okay. And, you know, even, even the owner, bless her heart, Faye, she's flipping amazing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people would have given up on, on mm -hmm. this dog. He didn't. She stuck with him. And by God, did he give back a, oh. the gratitude. Um, so with Tag, um, and you can see, so this is one of the items that we might use within free work. This is Tag's own bone puzzle feeder. Um, okay. Or, Bought out into the universe by Sarah Fisher, and they do now don't make them anymore because they were. Oh that no! Yeah, why, I mean, why don't they make so I, them? Um, they just discontinued them. Oh, they just discontinued them. So they're they're like hen's teeth to get hold of. But yeah. we can actually see here with with Tag with his placement there that that box is probably at the right height for him. Yeah. 
Um, and you can see that I've used different textures, different heights of things. He's able to move around freely. Yes, there's some laminate floor in there, but he does actually have a path that he can kind of um, move around with mats and things like that. So he's not slipping around yes. on there. But, but, you know, with him, we're actually looking, he looks very stiff behind with his hind limbs. He does yeah. look sore. He's not flexing and hit those stifles those knees very well he's actually so if we were to look at him from underneath he's actually doing that with his limbs rather than right. doing that so that that straightness that i was talking about that straight yeah. path he's actually deviating off that path um so i lay out the free work i actually because this is um i was i've worked with him for crikey i can't can't remember how long now probably Faye is watching this so she could probably put in the comments how long <laughs> i've actually been working with him for um so a we actually time. started a long, a long time. We actually started to bring in more items within the free work for him to work with. And um, you'll see shortly he'll kind of he's gone off into the hallway, but he actually stopped yeah. to have a drink. And the okay. bowl is actually raised on something that is too high for him. So he's actually starting to crane his neck. Um, um, so that was changed to something lower for him. So there you go. I stood up. Yeah. Tonight. You can yeah. have a look. So that posture for him is actually not comfortable. That mm. was changed pretty soon after there. But you can see he's actually got, even from that angle, he's actually got an actual slight kind of left rotation in his head. Um, and I'll get on to kind of what what was kind of like the issues that he had um, when he, which kind of free work changed his life, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it highlighted the fact that he was sore, um, and it was through um, the very first free work session I did with him. He actually invited contact with me, and I wow. saw <laughs> maybe. Yeah, and these are all things that you wouldn't necessarily, well, you wouldn't pick them up if you just, well, if you, you obviously couldn't do a clinical exam on him because he wouldn't let you, no, no, and you wouldn't no. just see it from doing a video of him walking up and down because it's not no. that. No, none no. of this going on in that. So yeah, no. it's really. Uh, when, when I, I'll get on to to cope kind of in the next bit but we you know coat can can tell you a lot of things and when i first met tag he looked like he'd been electrocuted his hair was like, really? uh, like wow. worst and in specific areas as well bless him yes um and I'll, I'll show you some of his coat patterns um shortly yeah but you can see as he goes back here how just how stiff and straight through those those hind yeah. limbs he is it's like walking sticks are just like that, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. and that's that's lovely that, that you've kind of done that because if you actually put yourself into yes, your, so. your dog's, you know, dog's paws and actually go, well, actually, how is he moving? How is that? Yeah. Kind of <laughs> it's not at all. Bless no. him. Bless his heart. He's such a dude. I just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love this dog passionately as people oh. know. Um, oh. So, so yeah, so this was, um, I'll, I'll tell you what, um, what was the matter with, with Tag. He, um, he was actually diagnosed with having um, quite severe bilateral hip dysplasia um, that w was missed um, initially and he ended up having... Is that because the couldn't, couldn't palpate or do anything, I suppose? Um, just that he was so lame on both hind limbs, it, it's... Yeah. It, I think it was difficult to, yeah, to actually exactly. uh, to diagnose. Um, once he was diagnosed, he then had to have both hips replaced. I think this video was after he had the first one done, which was his right hind. Um, okay. But yeah, once he had then the left one done, which was it with I think it was February um, okay. last year. Um, he's he's just unraveled even more. So yes, yeah. he still has reactive tendencies. He's lived a life in pain, but yeah. all. Oh, the, the change in him is brilliant absolutely brilliant so even just from the free work before he was even diagnosed and then had one hip done Faye would send me photos of my dog's just got on the sofa for a cuddle with me oh. like, send me a photo of just him lying over the top of her she goes I can't move and I'm like no don't <laughs> no no and this then is it a was, massive deal yeah huge huge deal huge deal yeah. because he, he, that's not something that he offered before no so, but Faye's just absolutely brilliant. And and yeah, I mean, the, the two of those are two, the team combined are very, yes, yes my heart, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's obviously so, taken a lot of work, hasn't it, to get to this a, point now? A lot of work. And Faye's yeah. trusting me to go, come on, we, you know, we need to do this or let's try that. And, mm -hmm. you know, 
really incredible. An incredible journey for, for everyone. It was an yeah. amazing dog. And I learned a lot from him, basically. He was the start yeah. of everything for me, really. For the free me. work. Yeah, definitely. Mm. It was the, it's kind of sealed the deal with how brilliant this technique is, basically. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So moving on to coat i thought you guys would love to see how this is so um, interesting because i was just saying uh, earlier to Gemma before we came live that it's not something that i really look for and um, i mean i will as of tomorrow i will be in there <laughs> but yeah <laughs> please do go on so it's different for every dog Okay, there are some common things that I see, and I believe when we chatted beforehand, Nikki, you were like, oh, actually, I see this quite a lot with arthritic dogs, but I've never yeah. considered it. So yeah. I thought I'd give you some examples of kind of conditions and what presented to me. It might be different depending on the dog. Okay, every dog is an individual, so they might not present the same. Okay, so this is, um, this, is an, this dog is another tag to me. Um, so if I tell you about her behavior, um she had this is this is the dog that's had issues right from when she was a puppy um so she started to become reactive to people and other dogs within puppy classes um to the point where she had to be removed from the puppy classes um because it 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 wasn't conducive to her to keep practicing right. behavior, and it wasn't giving the other dogs a good experience nor poppy to be quite honest so this is poppy yeah. she's an irish water spaniel she was about one year old when i met her and her fantastic humans and I don't know if you guys can see, but there is a ginger band um, that's around her middle, mm. around her thoracolumbar area, basically. So kind of like midway up her thoracic vertebrae coming down yeah. to pretty much halfway down her lumbar. And if we look on the photo on the right, um, incidentally, at, at, at this stage in her kind of journey, I was the only one that could get near her with a set of clippers. Wow. So, um yeah, because we just bought, built up this trust. I mean, she was highly yeah. reactive to people, to other dogs, you know, and she had a very small bubble and um, it took her a lot to trust her, to, to trust, yeah. every, you know, people that came into her life. And once you realise kind of what was going on for her, you kind of find out why. Yeah. So um, I, I had to clip her. Um, and what's interesting is, so if I tell you, she was diagnosed with spondylosis of the spine yeah. obviously um she also had hip dysplasia which was worse on the right hind and so, you can see that so clearly now now yeah, that you know kind of, kind of x marks the spot I yeah think. you know and people could say that that was not the best clip i'm not a groomer you know <laughs> but that is not where i've shaved to you know too much no. that, so irish water spaniels have a coat like a poodle that is where the coat has gone straight yeah. So the coat yeah. is giving an indication of what's happening underneath. Mm. So, yeah, so those hair follicles and how it's affected. I mean, it's just yeah. something you wouldn't you wouldn't even consider, really. You would, but no, it makes you would. perfect sense. Yeah. It just. I mean, and then she's on. So obviously, she's. She, I think she's four this year. So oh, wow. she's she's on pain meds she's on a bit of a cocktail of pain meds because as you know spondylosis is degenerative as is yeah. hip dysplasia she's got a bit of um, joint degradation in the left four as well but what's really really interesting is that what you can't see or you might be able to see she's actually got a tight patch of curls over this sacrum over this uh, okay. sacral area. and when i had to clip her it was matted right that patch where she was very very tense over that area had grown like, like a mat I couldn't yeah. you just couldn't get home through it or anything and it was literally I had to shave right down to the to the skin to kind of get that off yeah wow. it was incredible yeah. absolutely incredible so the coat can tell you a lot so Matt, much and it's yeah. not it's not always something that can be groomed out or just the way the dog is you know sometimes we need to kind of think well hang on a second what is this trying to tell us because yeah. what the dog isn't telling you it's coach your will <laughs> definitely yeah. definitely so and this is just one problem well, this is a clue isn't it and then you've got all these other clues as well yeah and so, so much I, information if i was to um if i was to show you some video footage of her sadly i don't have that um today but 
her the way she moved was a big giveaway as well so she was really stiff through the back she was cow hopped so she was knock kneed from behind basically right. and when she moved when she trotted she wasn't trotting in diagonal pairs as you've seen at the beginning yep. both limbs she was pacing so both limbs on the same side were moving in unison right. she okay. had this way this kind of wet nappy walk as she yeah. kind of uh, moved along and it just didn't look comfortable at all it's completely different now. So if I show you the comparison of then and now, look how yeah. much her has changed. So she's yeah. on um, she's on a bit of a cocktail of drugs. Um, she's on pain meds, but she's also on some behavior medication in there as well. Again, she's a dog that's lived a life in pain. Just, uh, just because you take the pain away or you manage the pain doesn't mean that the behavior that she's learned mm. over many, many years to tell people to leave her alone, that doesn't go away. It becomes habitual. It becomes ingrained into the dog. And I won't go yeah. too much into it because I know you've got the fabulous Chirag speaking yes, next week. Yes. Next week. Um, and obviously he's going to go into a little bit more in depth with that. But you can clearly see how, you know, once yeah, you start resolved some of the some of her issues how the coat is actually settled down and all, yeah. almost come back to normal yeah yeah definitely that's so, amazing totally amazing uh, um it, absolutely incredible so dog number two this is a golden retriever called milo who i'm still working with as well very good friends with his owner she's absolutely brilliant she's a dog trainer as well and um yeah so i was working with her because um for both behavior and kind of like massage stuff. And so he wasn't reactive in the same way as Poppy or Tag were. So mm -hmm. he was actually quite anxious. He actually shied away from contact. He was nervous of other dogs, particularly the younger ones, because they were more unpredictable. Right. Um, and he he just, yeah, he, he wasn't entirely happy with, with other dogs, but showed it in a different way, more withdrawn. Yeah. Um, and if you can notice his coat on the bottom, he's got yes. like this wiggly S shape. So it's like a zip, the, the bits of the zip that are being yeah. pulled together. Exactly, exactly. Now, 18 months after we found, found this, it was a bit of a struggle to get him diagnosed properly. Um, he was actually diagnosed with a um, stenosis of the spine. So that's a, a, a narrowing of uh, the space where the spinal cord actually runs within the yeah. vertebrae. And he actually had to have major surgery middle of last year. And this is this photo was taken just a few days ago. Same dog. Um, obviously, he's not sat straight here, but <laughs> look yeah, it looks totally different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally different. Totally different. So absolutely incredible and so much because he wasn't even particularly lame then he was just he a had little a bit cautious of... yeah so um as with tag he if we look from underneath he would swing out uh, right. when he walked but yeah. he, he wasn't lame in the sense that he was kind of hitching up no. the limb, thing like no. that um he'd shy away from contact at that end yeah um, and i could find heat and tension in that area okay um, but yeah, he's, I think he's three, three or four now. Oh, Again, I, 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 I saw dogs. Yeah. Yeah. And it just goes to show that, you know, these things aren't old, old dog. No. Can, they can happen from an early age. Absolutely. Really. Yeah. So that was the lovely Milo. So this is Tag. Um, and I thought this was really, really useful. So the, you yeah. can actually see the rosette on his hip. Yes. Spot. And then once his um, once his hip has been done, it's all looking beautiful again. Yeah, that's such a uh, just shocking. Because uh, you would say if somebody showed you those pictures and you didn't know, you would just say we're two different dogs. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, but then I, I can assure you they're not. Yeah, um, <laughs> that fluffy bottom a mile away. <laughs> very very well. But I mean, he ha he had. Um, he also had a slight rotation in his pelvis as well as having um, double hip dysplasia. But you could see areas where he was overworking, where he was overcompensating. And he had kind of midway up his spine. So where the thoracic vertebrae end and the, and the lumbar vertebrae start, yeah. that is actually a highly mobile joint within dogs. And yeah. he was overworking that area. And he actually had like a, what I'd call a cow lick flick. Right. His hair, um, which is a bit of a marker for him. It will kind of come up and go down depending on whether he's actually showing some tension. Okay. In that, area. Um, that area on the back, I find, because I do a lot of acupuncture and yeah. 
many, many of my dogs. That is a really sensitive part just around the Thoracolumbar junction. Yeah. And and again, I'll start looking more with a coat around the area as well. Because you it, know it's painful. It is. And the longer the dog, the the the, the more sore that that area will yeah. be, I find. Yeah. So it's it's just yeah. I just I love looking at coat. I love looking at coat. Yeah. So I thought I'd put in an arthritic dog for you as well so uh, you know like I said every dog will present differently now we've yes. had this discussion before I came on and and this is actually quite common for arthritic dogs it is yeah so this the lovely Penny Lidl um, lent me this this photo to use tonight we we know her dog has arthritis in hind end so as you can see it actually looks quite light even here you can start to see kind of she might be carrying a little bit of tension up here through overcompensating we can look yeah. at her she's shunting weight forward she brought the hind legs underneath but it's looking really dry really fluffy tufty, yeah tufty yeah and what you will probably find is that most people will think well I, my dog just needs a good brush yes. and yes that might be you know true to a certain extent but what you tend to find is or oh, certainly what, what i tend to find is with arthritic dogs they come out it comes out in clumps like yeah of it and it's it's it so so common and you can see here at the front as well um she's got patches mm. where it could be tension or this could be kind of um a little bit more, more arthritis obviously i can't diagnose that's down to you guys yeah. but these are all these are all but it's kind telling of you yeah yeah. Find you know what is going on. What is and if going you had on. a nice little video sent in from the owner at the same time as that photo, it would yeah. really help. Yeah, yeah, exactly. that's amazing. And it's a great, it's a great kind of like uh, shot for posture as well because we can see what the hind ends do and the feet yes. turned out. So the dog forwards. Doing, yeah, great to support. You know, yeah. and it, you can actually start to see the muscles. So that the you. Some people think that their dog's getting this big rough and, you know, in some respects they are right. But where the muscles yeah. start to overwork, specifically yeah. the trapezius muscles, which are here, you can then start to see them literally lift and the kind of the skin kind of lying over the top of them. So you can start to see, you know, where that weight is going to. Definitely, definitely. Incredible. So again, so the photo on the left is the same dog as the one before. But the photo on the right is of a different dog, and it just goes to show because this dog also had had has arthritis, and you can see it's the same thing. Yeah. But with this Labrador, she's gone kind of ginger. Yes. Well, and I see this a lot. Um, I was about so, to say you see this so much in older labs that come in for their boosters or just you know for general checkups. Yeah, yeah. But even on Penny's dog on the left, you can see there's a little bit of kind of ginger in there as well. And so it can be just a coat, coat color change yeah. um, and that can highlight these. But but with this dog um, and I worked with this dog for a number of years as well before she moved um, again, I could you could pull tufts of fur out. It's almost like the, the coat wouldn't fully shed and yeah. you it was just clumps and you just had to kind of help it on its way basically yeah. um but yeah again over areas that there was known to be arthritis within the dog so we've just got a little question which i think is actually quite good and was something i was just going to bring up but from shanta she just says um is it blood flow and or muscle tension that changes the coat patterns or how the fascia lies oh so com combination of everything i think we were discussing this beforehand exactly um, that, yeah it's a it can be a combination of everything so it can it can be restriction of blood flow and kind of not the right nutrients get into the the surface of the skin you have something known as the erector pili muscle which is attached to every single hair follicle you know and where where there's a muscle there can be tension yeah, you know? yeah. so and you know we talked about fascia and fascia can be restricted um and that can actually um affect the surrounding tissues as well so it can be a combination of everything um yeah. it, it all depends on the dog so it's individual to the dog yeah and, and amy's just brought up a really good point as well because i was saying earlier with some of the coat color changes the first thing that would spring to mind for some of them or slightly different cut different coats would be more hormonal conditions because those are also things that we see quite frequently and Amy's just said how often do you see changing coat color without arthritic changes and yeah you do and I guess it's you have to use this as well as everything else all the other information from the owners from the videos from your clinical examination so yeah it's um it's going to be different per dog but you're right Amy it may not be down to arthritic change but yeah. it's 
all as this global picture it will help you exactly which is why i've kind of put in um kind of a dog with stenosis and you know the coat pattern and you know uh hip dysplasia as well because it's individual to the dog yeah you know what one dog presents with another dog might not present with anything at all to do with the coat and and if you're you're going to have to go off um gait analysis or palpation or or what have you so it's yeah it's it's so interesting what i see a lot of is german shepherds with a big kind of almost like a stripe kind of thick kind of wiry coat change over their stifles right and okay they're kind of known and predisposed to kind of cruciate and hip kind of issues yeah. and that is a telltale giveaway to me that something isn't quite yeah. right or things going on there as yeah well. tawny's yeah. commented on exactly that actually she said that her dog booker after his tta surgery for cruciate the knee yeah. got gray the, yeah. the, the TTA knee got grey before the other knee got grey. So that's yeah. yeah, exactly what you just said. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It, it can give you so much, give you so much detail. Yeah, yeah. Super interesting. Cool. Okay. So moving on to Shake Off. You know, it's this is something else that I look at. I know I was gonna was gonna put in the the poop stoop, but I know yes. Julia already covered that. I do like a good poop stoop photo. Yeah, and video. I can tell you so much can tell you so much about how your dog's coping, but also so can the shake off. So this this video was given to me by the lovely Tessa, again, one of my students, and she was on it with her camera. So yeah. with a shake off, what am I looking for? So I'm looking for, for a dog that's got a leg in each corner. It's not overly wide, not overly narrow. There's a little bit of bend and flex within the joints because obviously they need to kind of wiggle all the way down their body. And that is that is the thing. It starts at the head and it moves all the way down the body. Yeah. So what we want to see is the dog actually being able to stand through that shake off. It is unusual for a dog to sit down or only partially shake off um, or stop midway. I saw a Dachshund the other day that sh- shook off, got to its um, got to the end of the thoracic vertebrae, stopped, and then picked it up at the pelvis. I was really. Like, ah! incredible yeah just really really incredible um so i would be and looking do we know yet if it had a disc problem or are we just guessing yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think there was um um yeah i think there was a, a disc problem within that i need to yeah. go back and check my group actually but i think yeah. there was something going on but it's yeah i mean we need to kind of look at these things and do you know what a shake off is so fast that the dog that the dog goes through um that you know it, you do need to slow it down yeah, but yeah. you can you can spot if your dog stops halfway through a shake off yes um, i've worked with a, a dog recently that um actually sat down halfway through the shake off and stopped that's not normal is it no not at all not at all <laughs> tag bless his heart he used to shake off and bunny hop with both back feet because he couldn't keep he couldn't uh you know the core strength to to kind of awesome. stay in that position um also he was off balance because obviously he he couldn't take full weight through the through the hind and yes. he was shifting weight forwards anyway so he literally used to fall out of his shake off um it was really interesting excuse me as well so you know we need to look at all these aspects to see how our dogs are coping yeah basically. yeah let's yeah. yeah. show that video again because puck the amazing puzzle puck yes yeah absolutely brilliant so she actually does a really nice shake off starts all the way from the head her feet aren't overly wide she's got a leg in each corner and and stay in the same place. yeah she can keep that same same position she does the hippie hippie shake at the end and it goes yeah. all the way through her tail which is lovely yeah. to see yeah. as well and then she stands there and has a bit of a oh i felt good Oh, you know apparently um, tracy i don't is that tracy's dog did you say she said watching for pesky squirrels oh tessa tessa yeah tessa oh, yeah. Cold, her dog yeah that's, that's a lovely perk oh no tracy brins tracy oh, tracy yes. knows best okay tracy. watching for watching for pesky squirrels she said out, quite out the window probably. now <laughs> yeah she, she stalks um squirrels out in her backyard this, this <laughs> absolutely hilarious he's amazing so kind of when we move on to this gorgeous gorgeous dog we can see that he's he's actually there's a lot of motion in the in the head and the neck and the shoulders yeah but he sat down 
Yeah. Now, I don't know what's going on for this dog, but it isn't normal to see a dog kind of sitting down or just dropping all of a sudden when they do a take off. I mean, even my dog, I've got an English bulldog. He will half shake. I know he's got stiffness in the hind end. And I know that that, you know, is the reason why he's not fully shaking towards the back right. end. So, yes. you know, for whatever reason, it's it's we can look at the, the quirky things that our dogs do. Yes. Um everyday to, things yeah to, to shed yeah. light on, on yeah. kind of what's going on for them definitely that's so interesting again there'll be loads of people tomorrow or tonight just watching people are gonna have to take a day off just to to do all these things i know i'm <laughs> sorry i'm sorry guys you know you've got some time before they release us out of lockdown so some of you yes, might get true. True. <laughs> so I think the question was asked, what should we be giving to our, our vets to help us or help yes. our dogs? So, you know, if you can do videos of walk and trot and activities of daily living. So I like to see dogs um, going up and down, maybe a, a small flight of stairs. Maybe you've got steps out in the back garden, that sort of thing, because I see a lot of dogs hopping um, yeah. or not using their limbs fully. Um getting in and out of cars as well as it is a big thing those sorts yes. of things how they lie how they sit how they get on and off the sofa for a bit of a smoosh um yeah. those sorts of things that that you know we can actually video and 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 use to actually help support our dogs help to get to the bottom of what's going on for them yeah. so photos of habitual natural postures sit down and stand and um, it's best that you capture them naturally and that you mm. don't ask them to do it so dogs that have been trained to do certain things on command they will sit pretty whereas if you were to naturally catch a dog doing a sit they might, they kind might of do off yeah yeah and yeah. Then when you start to go hang on a second does he always sit on that left hip you know again that yeah. can give you information yes and I'm, I'm a big big lover of comparing old photos and videos because we see our dogs on a daily basis yeah and when I do run a, run my courses and we actually start to do a bit of work on our own dogs, students find it really, really hard to start analysing their dogs in this way because not only are they um, too close to them physically, but emotionally as well. And we don't yes. like to think of our beloved dog, um, go, you know, going through maybe some discomfort, but also no. we do think that we might have missed something. No, um, then you feel really awful, don't you? Of course. You really yeah. Awful, but you know what I mean? Do you know you only know what you know at the end of the day? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and know. a lot of people that watch and that a lot of um cam followers and people that comment on, on Holly's Army, which is our group for owners to kind of share their stories or ask questions. Um, I've started to notice more and more that people say I had an arthritic dog um, and now I maybe didn't do it quite as well as I should have done and now I've got an eight-year-old dog and I just want to know am I doing the right thing what should I look out for so people are really aware of this and do want to you know, use yeah. their past experiences to make sure that they're doing things better the second time around I suppose exactly exactly and you know you, you can you can learn so much from every dog that comes into your life because yeah. it just means that the next dog you have, their life is more improved and the next dog and the next dog and the next dog. Yes. So, you know, it's it's all valid information and you learn, you know, they're the biggest teachers of, of yeah. how you support them. Just kind of watch your dog. Definitely, Definitely. watch your dog. Definitely. Same so, with children, really. My first child, not sure I did a great job, but the second one I learned from the first <laughs> one. <laughs> I think I, I'm doing better. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. we've got but a yeah. question from lynn about the shake off we've got a, well we've got a few questions about shake off um she's written my girl who doesn't have oa shakes off a few times a day but oddly will have a good effective shake off while on the move shortly after we set off for a walk any oh. idea what that's about uh, so it depends on the dog um that could be any number of factors that could be that she's just had a bit of a shake off to release release some tension so that's why dogs shake off um when they're coming out of a difficult situation i've seen dogs that have harnesses put on them and a, a little bit touch sensitive or harness sensitive that will shake off to kind of oh that just kind of feel like feels weird um so it, it, I, you kind of need to take it in context and i'd need to kind of know a little bit more information about yeah. about that but if the dog is already walking and they shake off then you know i wouldn't be t too overly concerned about as long that. as they don't then sit down halfway through it or yeah, struggle exactly. 
exactly. Yeah. I mean, my dog, when I take him out for a walk across this, the exact same road, halfway as we're crossing the road, he stops and shakes off. And it's like, really? <laughs> it's just a habit that he does. <laughs> yeah, just a habit that he does. He probably really would like to stay out for longer. You know, I'm yeah. trying to urge him to kind of go home because he's, he's kind of starting to put on the brakes because he's like, oh, look, there's, there's a brilliant sniff. <laughs> sniff that 25 times I only sniffed yeah. it 20 times and I have a routine to go through it um, so, I have to do this. yeah I have to do this and that's that's just one of his things he will shake off at a certain point um yeah. you know but it can be behavioral it can actually give you clues as to what's going on for your dog but you need to kind of gather more data and kind of what's going on before that point yeah. uh, where you know what's happening outside the front door sort of a thing so so yeah it could be a combination of things so. context. then we've got another question from rachel about the shake off and um, can i just ask what the shake off means when the hind legs leave the floor i'm guessing that i think you kind of touched on it it's just maybe not quite well balanced the core strength yeah, is quite not quite well balanced so i see a lot of when the dog has um, something going on behind they won't be able to keep all four limbs on the floor during the shake off and because they're unbalanced because it's not weight stupid distributed 60 percent on the front 40 percent roughly on the back yeah. it's actually more then 60% on the front because they're trying to weight shift you see yes. them kind of either lift in the back end or they'll actually move forward um mm. like I said Tag used to bunny hop um and used to kind of put his feet together as he, his hind feet together as he kind of fell out of shake off so yeah so I mean I think we're talking here about the the information that's good to give to vets but that kind of thing would be hugely useful to a physio or a hydrotherapist yeah. Massive just to time. know that you know actually this is where we need to be working or checking more you know just for again it all comes back to having a multimodal approach to managing whether it's arthritis or any painful condition yeah. and and using this information to use in all of those fields all of those areas that you're using to try and help with your dog exactly exactly and you, you should never take just one thing either it should be a combination of kind of okay let's have a look at different aspects of that dog's life and the way it's yeah. moving and the way it's doing so many things and yeah a multi-modal approach to kind of everything and have that team kind of yes. there and supporting you all on board yeah yeah definitely all singing off the same hymn sheet because yeah. you know there'll be things that that I miss that a physiotherapist will pick up and there'll be things that a hydrotherapist will miss that the vet will pick up and you know yeah. it can all kind of change but we're all working to the, to the same outcome which is to better support that dog and to ensure that their life is as comfortable and as enjoyable as possible yeah definitely definitely so is that uh, I mean we do have loads and loads of questions okay. um, but, but I'm quite aware that we're just almost at one and a half hours <laughs> No, I'm so sorry. No, no, it's fine. Because I, I, I can talk the hind leg off the donkey about stuff. It's so. <laughs> not, I, well, it's all my fault because I keep going. So what does that mean? Um, so what I'm going to do is ask Gemma to come back at some time, at some point, and, and go through these questions and maybe just get some other things, and we can go through a few other bits another time. Would that be okay? Yeah, absolutely. Love to come back. Love to because we would love to have you back on because there's a list of things that I also want to ask and I just feel like maybe I just <laughs> have my own private Zoom with Gemma and get, <laughs> get all this information. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'll go through all these comments and I'll try and answer them the best I can um, in yeah. the next couple of days. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I will bring it to an end, but we will yeah. definitely have Gemma back on. I will become her stalker, like she stalks Martin Fisher. Um, oh, and <laughs> we will have her back on at some point. <laughs> He's also so, some somebody you, that you guys need to need to. Yes, get on. I know. If Hannah's maybe, watching maybe this. I could maybe I could be mediator for that. Yes, yeah. great <laughs> idea. Okay, yeah, we're going to be in touch with him. Yeah. <laughs> if Martin, if you're watching, we're coming for you next. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, thank you everybody for joining us. I, I think you've learnt loads from all the comments that I can see coming up here. And please don't spend too much time watching your dogs in the next couple of days. Do remember to eat and drink as well. But um, thank you, Gemma, so much for coming on. And we will, we will um, hopefully see you again soon. Definitely, definitely. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye, guys.